pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for listening to my talk last year, <laughs> so, which is where this originally came from. And yes, I, I was trained as, as a physicist, as a theoretical physicist, actually. I, I don't quite know how to describe myself now. I mean, I, I still carry that with me, the training that I had those years ago. Um, I'm definitely trying to use it to understand how plants work, how biology works. Um, so now I'm kind of some kind of weird hybrid of physics, mathematics, biology. Um, you know, I've no formal training in biology at all. It'll amuse you to know that my, my highest qualification in biology is a GCSE. So at least I got an A. So, but, but, um, but no, I, all my training is in physics and mathematics. So I'm going to try to use, what, as Celia said, use what, what I learned long ago in physics and maths to try to leverage out what the underlying mechanism is for some rather complicated processes where it's not enough just to uh, do some experiments and stare at your data and then think that you know, a shaft of sunlight is going to come down from heaven and, ah, oh, I'm going to understand how this works. Sometimes it's basically just a bit too difficult to, 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 for, for, for you to really work in that way. So I'll try and explain that as, as I go along. So, but the first thing I have to do before I get into any of that is to tell you uh, what I mean by epigenetics. So, so this talk is going to be about trying to understand the basis of epigenetic memory, how biology, in particular how plants, remember things, and that remembering is not, absolutely not, encoded in the DNA sequence. Okay, so it's, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago this would have been absolute heresy. Right? I'm, you know, there's, there's things that biology remembers that's not in the DNA. But now it, it's sort of pretty routine. People have been studying epigenetics intensively for 30, 40 years now. And at its, in, in, in its strongest form, it's the inheritance of phenotype from one generation to the next um, that doesn't depend on changes in the DNA sequence. So it's not held in the DNA sequence. Now that's the kind of gold standard. And uh, it definitely happens in plants. It's quite controversial about whether it happens in humans, whether environmental exposure can be passed on from mother to, to, uh, to, to daughter and son. Um, so but I, I'm not really going to get into that. What I'm going to get into is a weaker form of epigenetics, which is not transgenerational through the germline, but which is um, simply inheritance through cell division. So a particular cell gets into a, a state, a gene expression program, and that state is perpetuated through mitosis, through cell division, so that the offspring of that cell inherit that expression state. So it's a weaker form of inheritance, but it still poses challenges to understand where that inheritance comes from. And originally, a lot of this work came out of, uh, as so often, from, from Drosophila genetics from, um, in, in the 1980s and 1990s. OK, so that's the, the fundamental problem. So I hope that's, that's clear to everybody memory and biology, not in the DNA. Um, now I want to switch for a, for a few slides to, to tell you about why someone like me might be useful to try to understand problems like that. Okay, so why am I thinking about this from a kind of mathematics and physics approach? So, so I'd like, like to take you through a little cartoon that one or two of the audience will have seen before and have to keep quiet if they know the answer to this bit. So, and this is to try to get across to you that intuition and just looking at things is not enough to understand some even quite simple systems. So let's try and imagine now I have a biology system. Ooh, <laughs> that wasn't part of the slide. Um, <laughs> so I have a green blob that turns on a blue blob. So it's, I don't know, it's a protein or there's, uh, it, it's a, a transcription factor that's turning on a gene. And you know, it's pretty obvious how that system will behave. You know, green comes on, and then a bit later the blue will come on. Right, pretty easy. Right. Now imagine that I, I make this one step more complicated. So now the green turns on the blue, which turns on the red. Right. And how would that work? Well, green comes on, a bit later the blue will come on, and a bit after that the red will come on. Pretty simple, don't need anything fancy to understand that. OK, now let's put one more interaction in, an inhibitory interaction. So the green turns on the blue, which turns on the red, which turns off the green. OK, so green turns on, comes up, blue comes up, red comes up, and then that turns off the first thing. Probably just about can understand how that works. Now imagine that the green inhibits the blue. Mm, right, so green turns on blue, which turns on the red, but the green is trying to turn on the red, and it's also trying to turn off the red at the same time. Ooh, so how's that going to work? Mm, yeah. And now imagine that the green tries to turn itself on. Right, so it's, it's, uh, there's a feedback loop from green to itself. Have some green, tries to make more green. OK, what does that network do? <laughs> Anyone have any idea? <laughs> 
right? It's three proteins, five interactions, and basically no one has any clue how it works. And if you gave that to me, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you how it worked, even though having worked on these sorts of problems for nearly 20 years, right? I recognize some things like a mutual inhibition tends to lead to, to switching behavior, but you know, it, there's enough in that to make it too complicated. What are the possible dynamics? I'm not quite sure. And this illustrates the point that even a quite simple system, three proteins, five interactions, is too complicated for anybody to tell you how, how it works, right? Just like that. It's, it, it, it's too difficult. So what are we going to do right, to understand even these quite simple systems? So there it is again, and there's some letters have appeared because it turns out those are proteins, and I'll tell you what the system is in a moment. Um, and the help is this, right? <laughs> it may not look like it, but that is the help. Right? Otherwise, you will not understand that network, ever, no matter how long you look at it. Right? You have to have some way of trying to put these interactions together and seeing what comes out in, in a way which is just too complicated for our minds to be able to do without some support. So, so what you do uh, in these sorts of systems is you write down some mathematical description of the system, and then because this is essentially a precise conversion of this into, into maths, now I can play with this, you know, either try to solve it with pen and paper, or I can put it onto a computer and I can simulate it, and I can see what I get. And so this helps you to be much more precise in the way you're thinking about these systems and understanding how they might behave. And it turns out that actually this system is an oscillator. Uh, actually, it's not from plants, it's from bacteria, it's from uh, something else. But I wanted to take something that wasn't plants deliberately, just in case anybody had seen it before. So this is about to be published. But it, it's actually a polarity reversal system, how, how a certain set of proteins oscillate from one end of a cell to, to another. Um, and that is not obvious, staring at this. And actually, even if you think the system might be an oscillator, there are certainly choices of parameters, because there are, there, are, there are numbers that control the strength of these interactions, where it's not an oscillator, where it will basically do nothing. It will just sort of sit there and, and, and not oscillate. So it, it's subtle, and we need help in order to understand how these systems work. And that's, in a nutshell, why the kind of approaches that I use are useful for biology. Right. OK, so you might be thinking, ah, oh, OK, three proteins, five interactions. That's so simple, right? That can't really be relevant to, to, to all of biology, right? Because all of biology really looks like this, OK? I've got some enormous network of proteins that are all talking to each other, all interacting with one another. And this is just a cartoon. I, I remember where this is. This is pulled off the web from somewhere for someone's claimed interaction network for some biological process. And it's very complicated. That's the only point I'm trying to get across. So how do we bridge this divide from what I told you in the last slide to, to the real thing. And in a, I think in a nutshell, that is possibly the central problem of contemporary biology, right? How do you understand a big network like this with very complicated behaviors um, uh, and, and that somehow our mind is not big enough to be able to incorporate all, all of this complexity? Well, there are several ways of going about this. And the one that, that I'm advocating is that you try to pick out little bits of it and you understand them properly. And once you understand them properly, you do this a few times, and eventually what you'll see is that the, the, the systems that you study, you know, the, the evolution has found the same solutions often, the same motifs start to appear, and then you can start to pick together the entire network from understanding little bits of it. So that's one approach to try to get at this complexity. There are other approaches as well. I mean, the, the most fashionable um, oops, is to essentially assay the whole system at once through a genomic approach. Try and measure everything, genome-wide data, you know, techniques like RNA-seq and chip-seq, where you try and measure you know, the, the, all the transcripts in the cell all at once. And that gives fantastic data sets, which are extremely difficult to interpret, because there's just so much information in them, you don't really know where to begin. And it's certainly, it's very hard to abstract out mechanism from it. You can get correlations, but it's very hard to understand how is this system really working from just trying to measure everything at once. So my kind of take is that we need both approaches. We need some sort of focused approaches to understand s systems properly, and then to take that knowledge back up genome-wide. And it's also very useful on, on on, on some occasions, to have the genome-wide data to then uh, uh, possibly go try and go the other way, go from the genome-wide data down to individual systems. But that's actually quite hard to do. I would say we need both. 
So that's my spin on this. And, and for those of you who know, this is basically reversing what most people think of as systems biology. Which systems biology is mostly being to try to take the entire network and understand it all at once. You know, I think personally that that's a problematic approach. OK, so I'm going to try to apply this to epigenetics. So, so this is something that I'm going to be talking about later, a little model. Don't worry about it for the time being. It's our kind of model for how we think epigenetic memory works in biology. And I'll, I'll tell you more about it later on. But we're going to try to adopt this strategy to epigenetics. I'm going to try to understand one particular locus, one gene, how something really works in, in some detail and really trying to understand it. And then once we've got that understanding, we can uh, try and apply it to other systems and go genome-wide and see, and see how other systems work. OK. And we're going to do this, this process of understanding. It's going to be an iterative process. I hope that will somewhat come across in the talk. I'm going to try to come up with some ideas theoretically, build some models, test them experimentally. They don't always work. Refine the ideas, go back and test them again. And you go around this loop that lots of people talk about, but actually remarkably few people actually do, because it's quite difficult. But you know, that's the kind of gold standard for what we want. You know, put the, the modelling and experiments, combine them, so they're really talking to each other in a way in which they talk back to each other. OK. Right. So, yeah, I said that. Right. OK, so now back to the, to the um, epigenetics again. So what questions would I like to answer with this approach? And here are some of the questions I'd like to answer. How do you store epigenetic memory? It's essentially the most basic question in the field, right? I've claimed to you that you can store information in biological systems, and it's not in the DNA sequence. So how do you store that information? Where is it stored? How has the information got out from these systems so that it can be used? Um, these are all really deep questions that, are, that have not yet really been solved, right? So it's, um, it, and it's a very important one. The second one, which is slightly in conflict with this first one, is how do you change these memory states? So imagine a cell ends up in a particular transcriptional state, it's, it, or it's differentiated. It, it's turned itself into a certain type of cell that does something. And then the cell says, ooh, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do something else. So it needs to change what it does. And to do that, it needs to change these memory states, to, to, to alter a particular program and replace it with another one. And so that means that not only do these epigenetic memory states have to be stable, they also have to be kind of plastic. You've got to be able to change them where, under the right circumstances. And these two criteria are actually a little bit in conflict with one another. If something's stable, then it's hard to change. Right? So how do you change it? And the biology needs to be able to change it. It may be the case that it's easy to change, but then it might not be very stable. So it's not really memory. So as you can see, these two things are a bit in conflict with each other. Unfortunately, I can't really talk about the second one. I don't have time, but there's very interesting questions there. Maybe it will come up in the question sessions later. OK, and the third thing I'd like to, to talk about, which I will have time, hopefully, is, is how does all this memory stuff talk to normal transcriptional control? Right? N by normal transcriptional control, what I mean is you have a transcription factor and it turns a gene on and it makes RNA and it makes protein right? in a conventional central dogma kind of a way. Right? Ha so that's certainly going on. So how do these kind of funky epigenetic memory systems talk to the more normal gene regulation? Okay? That's also a, a, a deep question which the field is only starting to get to grips with. Right, okay, I've said that. Right, where are we going to study this. This is where the plants come in. So is there a single system where we can look at all of these questions together? And it turns out that there is, and it's in plants. <laughs> so um, it's this gene called flowering locus C, ethyl C, which controls flowering. And we're going to be looking at this in, in Arabidopsis. Um, and this is terribly important for plants, because this, uh, this switch is controlling the developmental cycle of the plant so that it's aligned with the seasons. So that in the spring, the plant does the right thing. You know, flowers can produce seed and so on. Um, and without this, obviously, it's going to be at a severe reproductive disadvantage. And it turns out, in a way, I'll tell you in a moment, that epigenetics is intimately related with this process of aligning plant development with the seasons. OK. So let me just tell you a bit more about this, this of, of what this gene ethyl C does. So it controls this switch to flowering. So one of the two most important decisions that a plant makes, right? The first one is whether to germinate, and the second one is whether to flower. 
right? absolutely critical decisions in the life cycle of a plant. And FLC controls this switch to flowering. Um, and it's a handbrake. It stops it. Right? If FLC is expressed, the plants will not flower. They'll just go on growing vegetatively. They, they will never make this transition. So somehow, if the plant's going to flower, it's got to switch that gene off. And there are a bunch of pathways that do that. Uh, actually, Frigida doesn't. It's the one that upregulates it. <laughs> but the other two pathways do. There's one called the autonomous pathway, which I won't talk about. But the one I will talk about is something called vernalization. And vernalization is the process by which plants need to be exposed to a prolonged period of winter cold before they will accelerate their transition to flowering. And the essential idea is, is that FLC is a floral repressor, so it's stopping the switch. When you expose the plants to cold, the cold represses the repressor. So you turn off FLC, and because FLC is itself repressing the flowering, you then allow the switch to happen. So you, you repress the repressor. And if you repress the repressor, that's the same as activating, because you're turning off the repression. Okay? Uh, and as I say, the correct timing is vital to stop events like this, where it flowers in the snow and it has a limited chance of reproductive success. It wants, obviously, this. So the timing of this is very important. OK, that's great. What's this got to do with epigenetics? Why is this an epigenetic problem? Okay, so, so far, it's not clear what, what this has to do with memory. So this is a cartoon of what happens to FLC expression during the seasons. So it starts out high, and during the winter, as I told you, it gets repressed by the cold, right? So expression goes down. Uh, the interesting thing is what happens after the cold in the following spring. So the plants have had their winter, but the, the plants remember the fact that FLC has been repressed. So it's remembered the fact that it's had this exposure to winter, and the, and the, and the repression of the gene is maintained even after the signal that was causing that repression has gone, okay? Because you're in the spring, the cold's finished, it's done with, right? It's in, it's in the past, yet the repression is still there. So the repression that's caused by the winter cold is maintained. So in, in, in essence, the plant has remembered that it's been exposed to cold and has continued to repress even in the absence of that environmental signal. And in fact, the plant's even more clever than that because if you give the plants more cold, they repress more, and they remember that lower level of expression as well. So it's kind of quantitative epigenetics. The more cold you give these plants, the more you repress FLC, and however much you repress it, it remembers that level of repression even after the cold has gone. So this is why it's epigenetics, because there's a transient environmental stimulus, that's the cold that turns off this gene, and then once the cold has gone, the repression is maintained, so it's remembering something, and therefore it's by definition an epigenetic process. Can't be stored in the DNA, right? There's no change to the DNA sequence going on here through the seasons, so it's got to be something else. Okay, so this, this quantitativeness is actually quite appealing for someone like me who thinks about things quantitatively, right? How on earth does the plant manage to generate this quantitative memory response? More cold, more repression, and, and we'll come back to that. Okay. Now, this is a slide, because often I give this, this talk to you know, mammalian audiences, or uh, <laughs> not, not audiences who are human, <laughs> audiences who work on mammals. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's right. Often I just talk to plants. I'm like Prince Charles, right? <laughs> so, um, so they're thinking, oh, you know, oh, it's plants, right? Oh, God, it can't be interesting. You know, plants, they're still in the Stone Age somehow. They just learned how to do PCR or something. So, you know, why, why is this system really good? Why, I can tell you honestly, hand on heart, this is the best system in all biology to study epigenetics. And we understand this system better than anyone else's system. You know, in, in human systems, in Drosophila, uh, uh, in C. elegans, any of them, we understand this better. And, I, and, so, and the plants have a massive advantage here. And I just wanted to take a slide to explain to you why. Um, so first of all, there's this really interesting life cycle that we can study in detail, where you start off with high expression, you then switch it off, and then you maintain it. Okay? And you can see all of that just in the natural growth cycle of the plant. And one of the key features of this, of this process is that it's slow. Right? It happens over months during winter. 
And that's, that immediately is an advantage because many of the competing systems in, in other organisms are over like that, right? If you're in your software development, right, it's probably over in 12 hours, right? Because the developmental life cycle is so fast and therefore it's, it's hard to get in there to, to dissect it. As I said, it also has this quantitative aspect to it, which is, is very interesting and is going to be another lever we're going to use to understand how this system works. It's environmentally controlled. That's really convenient, right? All you have to do to, to, to interrogate this epigenetic system is stick the plants in the cold and then take them out again and then measure things, right? Um, so, and they're supposed to do this. This isn't some weird mutant, right, which you have in many other systems. Natural, wild-type plants doing what they always do, which is responding to winter cold. Um, Okay, and another key thing is that the system that, this, that, that actually does this memory is something called a polycom system, I'll tell you about it in a moment, but it's completely conserved. It's in Arabidopsis, in Drosophila, it's in you, right? And it's mutated in cancers, for example, leukemia. And it's all the same, it's exactly the same conserved apparatus. You know, the protein names change, but it's the same stuff. Um, as we'll see, this system has the cleanest readout of epigenetic memory in all biology, to my knowledge. I say that and no one's ever contradicted me. I'm always worried someone will say, yeah, I've got my system that's better than yours, but no one's ever said that so far. So I think it's true. Uh, and the last one's for experts, so I'll skip over that one. Right, so we're going to use FLC and we're going to use it to completely beat up epigenetics until we completely understand it, right? That's the plan. Right, first question then, to go back to what I said before, how do we store epigenetic memory? Where is it stored? And in particular, I'd like to distinguish two, f two ways you can store memory, which I'm calling in trans and in cis, which is your common biological jargon, trans and cis. So what do I mean by that? So trans in, bio in a biology context normally means things are kind of distributed, spread out, and can communicate over long distances. And you can have memory systems that work like this. And these have been known actually for 50 years, going back to work in bacteria in the 1960s. And the basic idea is that you have a transcription factor network that has strong feedback. So you turn it on with some environmental stimulus, and you've got some transcription factor that binds to DNA, you know, makes RNA, makes protein, and feeds back on itself. So as soon as you start that loop, and you start making the stuff, you make some RNA, you make some protein, the protein binds back to the regulatory elements, and it makes more pro RNA that makes more protein, and, you, and, you, and suddenly the whole expression of the gene comes way up. And, and it's, the feedback is so strong that even if you remove the stimulus, the positive feedback by which the transcription factor makes more of itself can ensure that these networks stay on, right? So it's, it's just basically a conventional transcription factor binding, eventually making protein, but that protein binds back to the DNA and makes more of itself eventually. So it's a positive feedback loop. So those systems can also keep themselves on. But there are other ways of doing it. And these are the cis-based memory systems. So here, and now I'm going to have to introduce you to a little bit more biology in a moment, you're not storing the memory in these networks of transcription factors. So, so here the memory is really stored by some transcription factor that's just floating around, and it's at a high concentration, and that's the memory. The fact that it's at a high concentration and not a low concentration. But you're storing the memory sort of everywhere. There's, there's this transcription factor is diffusing throughout the cell. So the memory is all over. It's distributed. It's not local to any spot in the cell. In these cis-based memory systems, the memory is held locally. Um, now, it's not part of the DNA sequence, but it's held on top of the DNA sequence. And there are various ways in which you can do this. And the one that I'm going to be talking about uh, is where you apply covalent modifications to histone proteins. So as you hopefully know, DNA doesn't just get crunched up inside cells, right? It, it gets wrapped around these, these molecules called histones, and, and groups of histones are called nucleosomes, and it's part of the compaction process by which DNA is, is, is you know, compressed into a very small volume inside the nucleus. And it turns out that these, so here's a cartoon of that, right? here's the DNA, and it's wrapped around these kind of barrels, which are, which are the nucleosomes. And it turns out these barrels, these nucleosomes, can take chemical modifications like phosphorylation, methylation, semethylation, you know, there are loads of these guys, right? And, and this is kind of an extra code that can be added on top of the DNA sequence, um, which in principle could store information. And in fact, it's believed that there are enzymatic complexes whose job it is to read and write this histone code 
right? So it's, it's information that's placed on top of the DNA sequence and it's, and it's sitting in these, in these chemical modifications to the histone proteins. And one uh, complex we're going to be particularly interested in is something called PRC2, Polycon Repressive Complex 2. And that's an enzymatic complex that adds a certain type of histone modification. And this is histone H3 lysine 27 trimethylation. So, you know, you get, you get used to saying this very quickly in the game, you know, K27 trimethylation, because you say it all the time. And all it is, is a modification that turns genes off. So if there's a gene here, you know, with, this is the DNA that codes, and, and it's wrapped around these nucleosomes that have an, a trimethylation at this particular position, that will switch that gene off. It's a silencing modification. Okay? And it turns out that there's a whole apparatus that puts this stuff there, that somehow knows where to put it, which is an interesting question, and actually also has the ability to copy the marks. So not only can it recognise them, but it can, it can bind to, to marks that are already there and then try to add more around it. So there's kind of a positive feedback mechanism here, that you have some marks there, then the enzymatic apparatus exists inside these cells to recognise that mark and add more of them in a positive feedback loop. And we'll come back to that. So the idea is that it's these marks that are holding the information right? Not the DNA sequence, but it's, it's held in these modifications. That is the epigenetic memory. That's recording the information. For example, what gene expression program should this cell be implementing? Well, there are a bunch of histone modifications sitting on top of the, de the genes that are telling the system what genes should be exp expressed, what genes should be silenced. And the information is held in these guys. That's the claim. We'll come back to that. Okay, there's one immediate problem with this idea some of you might have spotted already, or might know about. Okay, so it's the information stored on these histone proteins. What happens at DNA replication, right? Okay, so here's your, uh, the, the, the parental strand with these histones. Now you go through DNA replication. There's immediately a problem, because you don't, obviously don't have enough of these histone proteins to completely coat both daughter strands. You've only got half the required number because now you've got two strands. And what happens is that essentially the parental nucleosomes get distributed randomly to the daughter strands, you know, get passed out 50-50. So what you end up with is a depleted, two depleted strands with more or less random numbers of nucleosomes on them, and then it's filled in with new nucleosomes. So this is obviously a major, really major problem. If you are claiming, right, the memory is stored in these, new, these histones and the marks that are on them, and then whatever this memory system is, it's got to be able to survive a 50% dilution. Because what, that's what happens every time it goes through DNA replication. So how on earth can you have a memory system that can survive losing half of it every time it goes through DNA replication? So it's a serious, serious problem with this idea. And I'll get back to you in a few slides with how the, how the biology solves this problem. OK, I just said that, right. OK, so, um, so let's get back to this transist thing, right? Where do you store memory? Right, this has actually been controversial very, you know, up until very recently, a few, uh, three years, two or three years ago. You know, can you store memory locally in the way I've just outlined? Right? I've already told you, there are these problems with these histone-based memory systems. Is it conceptually even possible that you can store the memory like this? Or actually, is all the memory these trans-based systems of transcription factors? And if you talk to people like Mark Tashney, some of you may know, I don't know he's a, one of the founders of the, the field of gene expression, worked in Lambda phage in, in, in bacteria, he'd say that all this cis memory stuff's total garbage. Right? It's all transcription factors, and all you're seeing through these histone modifications is because a transcription factor has turned off a gene, so it's off, and as a consequence of that, it attracts these histone modifications on top of it because it's already been silenced. So in that way of thinking, these histone modifications don't cause the memory, they're just a consequence of the memory. Right? Do you see the, see the point? It's, it's a, it's a cause-consequence issue. Do these histone modifications actually store the memory, or are they a consequence of the memory being stored somewhere else and the gene being turned off, and then the histone modifications appear? But they're not storing any memory. They're just there because the gene was switched off by something else, right? And the field's just been stuck on this problem for years, right? And, and it's very difficult to break this cause-consequence uh, issue. We're able to. <laughs> I'll tell you in a moment how. Right. 
Okay, so, um, yeah, and the other question, which is related to this, you know, dilution of, of histones, is how do you store memory, right? And there's basically two ways in which you can store memory of things, right? And I've illustrated it by these digital watches and this analog watch, right? One way, so let's imagine I want to turn a gene off, okay? So I want to reduce the expression of a gene. So it starts high, ends up low. How can I do that? Well, there's actually two fundamentally different ways I can do it. I can do a digital process or I can do an analog process. So what do I mean by that? So imagine I have a digital process. So here are cells that are expressing some RNA and there are a few that are off. And as time goes by, I turn more of the, G of, of the cells off. Okay? So it's an all or nothing thing. I'm just turning more of them off. So, so the cells that are, are expressing still express to the same level, but there are fewer of them later on. Right? On the other hand, there's kind of an analog way of doing it, where again, I'm turning off the expression of this gene, but I'm kind of doing it the same in all the cells. Right? So in one case, I'm smoothly reducing the expression level with time. In the other case, in each individual cell, it's on, 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 and then suddenly it goes off. Right? And, and I'm just increasing the number of cells that I'm turning off. And that's kind of a digital way of doing it compared to an analog way. But if I grind up the plant and measure RNA levels in the way that people do, you can't tell the difference, right? You'll, me you'll measure exactly the same thing, right? Because I'll have mixed all the cells up. So you can't tell whether things are being stored digitally or in an analog way, whether the expression is going down smoothly or whether it's being turned off in an all or nothing fashion at individual, uh, uh, individual cell level. And you need single cell experiments to, to actually tell this, and I'll show you some in a moment. So that raises the question, is the memory digital or analog? So I've, I've raised two fundamental questions, right? One here, how do you store the memory, digital or analog? And where do you store the memory, trans or cis? And I will answer both of those questions. Right, so back finally to FLC. <laughs> so I told you about this plant system. So, and, and remember, it's storing the memory of winter cold. And interestingly, this histone modification I told you about, the, the mouthful H3K27 trimethylation, FLC has got that. So if you measure the levels of this modification across the gene, you, you know, so this is the FLC gene, it's, it's about 6 kb, um, and this is what happens to, the, to this histone modification as you give the plants more cold. So it starts out low, and then the expression, uh, and sorry, and then the K27 levels rise the more cold you give it. Yeah. So that is consistent with these histone modifications being the memory of the cold. Because the more cold I give it, the more K27 trimethylation I measure. So the orange is two weeks of cold, the green is four weeks of cold, the blue is six, and the red is eight. So more cold, more histone modifications. So that makes potentially sense that... Um, these histone modifications are really the causal memory element for what's storing uh, the, the, uh, the memory of the cold. And remember, the more of this I have, the more I'm going to silence the gene. That we could explain this quantitative response. Okay. So now I have to tell you something about the model. So, so you know, a lot of conceptual questions, right? Where do we store the memory? Is it digital or analog? Now we've seen that the FLC system itself, we've got these K27 trimethylation levels, and the more cold I give it, the more of this histone modification I see. But you know, what's going on at, a, at an individual copy of this FLC gene inside an individual cell that's causing this, the, these memory states to be set up and then remembered over such long periods of time? So here it kind of starts to help to conceptualise it and start to write down some models for how these systems might work. So that's, that's what these cartoons are. I'll explain them in more detail in a moment. But conceptually, this is what you need to remember, right? Is that essentially it's a tug of war going on between an, an on state and an off state at an individual copy of the gene. So, you know, there's, there's a set of things that are trying to turn the gene on, you know, activating histone modifications, maybe transcription factors, and they're pulling in one direction. And there's another bunch of stuff, including these histone modifications, the silencing ones, that are trying to turn it off. And essentially, only one of them can win. Right? It's like a conventional tug of war. Right? If you really do have a tug of war, you know, tug of wars don't end in draws. Right? One team wins eventually, one team will get tired, and then they'll get dragged over. Right? And it's a bit like that here. 
only one of these states is stable uh, and will be stably maintained in the system. You can't have a half-on state. Okay, and I'll come back and explain to you in more detail why that's true. But what that means is, is that these systems are essentially digital in the way that they can encode information. They can only store essentially a zero or one. So, so it's either in a high expressing state where, where it can make lots of FLC in this case, or it's in a low expressing state where it can't make any at all. And it's one or the other. It's not in the middle. The gene is not half on in these sorts of systems. So it's kind of a digital response if, this, if these models are right. And that goes back to this uh, issue I raised a few slides ago of how on earth do you store memory when you go through DNA replication and you lose half the things where your memory is allegedly written, right, on these, on these histone proteins. And that is just a colossal problem for any system that is not a kind of digital memory system. So here I'm claiming that these systems are inherently digital. They're either on or they're off. And that means they have the ability to survive even if half of the memory forming elements are removed. And the reason it can do that is because it's basically a digital system. It can bounce back. It's only storing a zero or one. So if it goes from a fully on state to sort of half on, it can recover that and go back to the fully on state. And it can do that because it's a digital system. Analog systems wouldn't be able to do that because they, they would actually lo completely lose their memory as a result of this dilution by 50%. But because of the fact that it's, uh, it's a digital system, it gives it enough robustness to survive being, having half of its memory taken away. It can bounce back because of the feedbacks that I'll tell you about in a bit. So if there's anything in these ideas, then it predicts that these memory states that I've been telling you about at FLC should be digital. They should be all or nothing expression states at an individual gene. That's the key thing to remember. All or nothing, not in the middle. And if this is true, that each individual gene is either expressing or not expressing, then the only way I can get this quantitative reduction in FLC expression, because remember, the more cold I gave it, the more I repressed FLC. The only way you can do that is from increasing the fraction of genes that are turned off with more cold. So that goes back, essentially, in this cartoon I had before, to this digital system on the right, whereas, oops, I've gone too far. Right? As, as, I go, as time goes by in the cold, I switch more cells off digitally. And at a population level, that corresponds to a reduction in expression. OK. So there's a lot of quite possibly new ideas here. Digital expression, it's not just a smoothly reducing uh, in, in each cell. Its individual cells are switching off and, the, and with increasing duration of cold. And the more cold I give it, the more cells switch off. So is this true? <laughs> right? It's a you know, nice idea. <laughs> but you know, obviously, you have to go back and do the experiments to see whether this is true or not. And, and as I said earlier, you need to look in individual cells. It's no use grinding up whole plants and measuring their RNA levels. You'll never, you, you just can't figure it out that way. You've got to look in individual cells. And so that's what we did. So what we did is we hooked up FLC to a fluorescence reporter called Venus, which is just one of these you know, fluorescent proteins. And we put it in the roots of Arabidopsis plants, and we measured the uh, fluorescence. And what you're seeing here are Arabidopsis roots that will be exposed to two, four, six, eight, and 10 weeks of cold. And at two weeks, not much cold. So FLC hasn't been repressed yet, right? 10 weeks of cold, lots and lots of cold, fully repressed, everyone's off. The interesting thing is what happens in the middle, right? Where they've only partially verbalized the system. And it turns out that what you see is a very all or nothing response. Some cells are completely off over here, some cells are completely on. And if you measure this in thousands of cells, this is what you see. You see a kind of double peaked structure where you've got a bunch of cells that are off and a bunch of cells that are on, supporting this idea there's essentially a digital uh, expression states in these cells, that it's the FLC is either expressing or not expressing. Okay? So there's support from that idea from these single cell experiments. And you need to do the single cell experiments, otherwise you'd never be able to tell the difference. Between, uh, you can't tell from population level whether it's a digital response or an analog response. Okay, the other thing you'll also have noticed by now, okay, these are the roots, obviously it's a root tip down here. What on earth are these stripes, right? So I've, 
nothing I've said so far really, really tells you what they are. I've told you that this response should be an all or nothing response. So why do I not see a kind of you know, salt and pepper pattern of individuals, some cells that are on and some cells are, are off? Why have I got this enormous, you know, like, like, like that coming out of the root tip? Okay, to understand that, you need to know a little bit about where the stem cells are in a plant root. So it turns out that the stem cells are sitting at the tip of the, just, just behind the tip of the root. And these are the cells that are dividing and making the new cells as the, as the plant root grows downwards. And so what's actually going on in, is, is that these stem cells are the ones whose, whose ethyl C expression state is being digitally flipped from on to off. Okay, so that's illustrated by these cells going red here, right? these stem cells that are being flipped. And then st stem cells do what stem cells do, which is produce lots more cells. And what's happening is that you're seeing all the cells that have come out of, of one stem cell down here, and they've copied the gene expression state from that stem cell. So what you're seeing in these pictures is all, is, you, you, you can see immediately, this is epigenetic inheritance through cell division and through mitosis, right? Because you're seeing all these cells that have copied their gene expression state from the stem cells sitting down there, right? And you just see them all lined up because one of the other fab things about plant cells is they don't move. So you don't have to do any complicated lineage tracking to work out which cells you know, grew out of which other cells. It's just blindingly obvious because they all line up on top of each other. And so all of these cells came from that stem cell down there and they copied the FLC expression state in that stem cell, either on or off. And you see it in these enormous files. So again, to my knowledge, that's the best example in biology of at least mitotic epigenetic inheritance because you just see it straight away. It's really obvious. Okay. So now hopefully we've, we've shown that, yeah, these expression states are digital um, uh, very clearly uh, from, from these sorts of uh, um, uh, 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 histograms and that the way the FLC does a quantitative response is it turns more cells off with a, as a function of time in the cold. Okay, but now using a similar system, we can get at this question of where do you store the memory? Is it stored locally in the chromatin? Everything I've told you so far would point in that direction, with these histone modifications and that kind of thing. Okay? But I haven't, I haven't completely finished off the alternative idea that the memory is stored in these transcription factors that's floating around in, in the cell. How can I tell whether it's one or the other? Well, it turns out with, a, with this fluorescent labelling approach, you can tell, and there's a trick. And this is the trick. The trick is to label two copies of your gene so I'm now going to have one copy of FLC labelled with Venus, which comes out sort of yellow, green under the microscope in the confocal. And I'm going to label another one with something called M. cherry, which looks kind of red, right? So I've got two copies of the gene making FLC protein, but with different colours. So how does that help me? Well, think a little bit about what would happen to that system if I had a trans memory system. So the memory was stored in some transcription factor that was floating around everywhere. Well, both copies of my gene, remember one is now yellow and one's red, will see the same transcription factors, right? Because the transcription factor is floating around, it's diffusing around in the nucleus, they see the same environment. So they should respond the same way, because they're seeing the same memory state. So they should both be on or both be off, right? Because they see the same transcription factors. On the other hand, if the memory is held locally in the chromatin, in the, on top of the DNA, you know, local to one gene copy, that means that each gene can do its own thing, independent of the other one. doesn't care what the other one does because the memory is stored locally. That means there are four expression states. They can be on-on, on-off, off-on, or off-off. And these intermediate states where one is on and the other is off are not accessible to the trans-memory system because of the way the memory is stored in a trans-memory system. Right. So, at least in principle, now we can tell the difference. So let's do the experiment, right? So here is the Venus, here's the cherry. And this is before the cold, just to show you that they're all expressing. And now this is what you see after the cold. And if you zoom in on this bit, this is the interesting bit. Here, there is a file of cells that express Venus, but no cherry. Here, there's a file that expresses cherry, but no Venus. And here's a file that expresses both. And there's the merge over there. 
So we've got lots of pictures like this, and this clearly indicates that you can maintain a file of cells, so maintain epigenetic memory, in a state where only one copy is on and the other is off. And that is impossible to maintain in a trans-memory system. So we've effectively proven through this double labelling that the memory has to be stored locally in CIS, which is what the model suggested. OK, I've got just enough time to just probably one slide about what the, what, what the model is. So, I, so, so far I've told you that these, these memory states are digital. I just wanted to introduce our latest thinking for what we, how we think these systems work. So this is a bit more conceptual, but anyway, that's the last slide now, so if you're being a bit overwhelmed, you can, you can relax, because I'm nearly at the end. So you know, w these memory states, so far I haven't, haven't told you too much about the models, but really what's going on is you've got, you've got a series of methylation states. So this trimethylation state is strong memory. No methylation is, is, is there's no silencing going on. Trimethylation, strong silencing. And I've got a series of transitions between these states. As I told you much earlier on, the enzymatic apparatus exists inside cells to copy these marks and propagate them. And that means you have feedbacks, which means these marks try to add more of themselves through this PRC2 complex, actually. So in this kind of cartoon, that gives me arrows for the methylation making more methylation. But on the other hand, you know, what, are the, what does this methylation do? Its function is to repress transcription. That's the point, right? These marks are supposed to turn off transcription. So these methylation marks have to stop transcription, so I've got inhibition here. On the other hand, transcription, just the act of transcription, antagonizes these highly methylated states. Every time a polymerase, POL2, that makes RNA, goes through this gene, it will attempt to wipe out these histone modifications, or alternatively kick out a nucleosome on which these modifications are sitting. And so it will try to remove them. So that's trying to push you in the other direction. And then, of course, transcription, you can modify through transcription factors. So what I've sort of developed here is a kind of very simple module for trying to bring epigenetic memory, which is you know, this methylation business, together with more conventional transcription factor control. Okay. And one of the interesting things is that you can then start to ask questions about what happens when I bring digital memory systems together with more conventional analog transcription factor control. And so here's actually some maths, finally, right? I had to show something to convince you that I really do do this. You know, so that's the model, that's the cartoon. Th this is the model implementation, right? This was published last year in Cell Systems. That's the entire model, right? I'm not hiding anything from you, right? There's some mathematics. It's honestly not very difficult. It's a stochastic simulation. You just draw random numbers on a computer, and then you iterate it billions of times, and you, and you, and you just simulate. I think the point I'm trying to get across to you is these, these techniques are not magic. They're not you know, impossibly difficult to understand. Yeah, they're possibly unfamiliar, but if you make an effort, you can understand it and um, 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 what we're doing here. It's not a kind of you know, magic wand that you wave and suddenly these, these results come out. It's not, honestly, that difficult, really. <laughs> it may look intimidating, but it's, it's not. I mean, if, if, if you sat down for a half an hour or an hour, you'd basically understand what, what this is. It's really not that difficult. And these are the outputs from these simulations where you can see methylation being maintained and these massive drops every time you go through DNA replication, right? It's, it loses half the marks, but because of these strong, strong feedbacks, it just copies all the marks back and boom, goes back up to full methylation again, right? So that's, that's how it can survive these DNA replication events. We can parameterize the model. I don't have time to talk about that. Last thing I really wanted to say is that you know, conceptually, what do these sorts of models do to us, do enable us to understand? They, it, what we're trying to do here, and this is still very early days of this, is to try to bring together these two fields of people who think about epigenetics and memory and how you, how you memorize gene expression states. And on the other hand, there's another field of people who worry about transcription and how transcription factors do, do transcription and make RNA. And these two fields don't talk to each other at all, really which is a bit weird. But actually, it's two sides of the same coin. Because if I have one of these digital memory systems, which is basically what's going on in this window, where I can have a stable on state and a stable off state, and I now try to drive it with transcription factors, I can erase this memory and put it into whatever trans transcription state I want. So when you bring these two sorts of systems together, the digital memory and the more conventional transcription factor control, the only point I want to make here, the details don't matter, is that you get 
interesting, possibly counterintuitive gene expression states. And you need to bring the understanding from both these fields together to properly understand you know, how transcription and epigenetic memory properly talk to each other. OK, so that's all. That's the end. So just to wrap up, I've tried to tell you about how vernalization and the memory of winter works in plants. And I tried to convince you that it's a digital memory system. And if fundamentally, it's digital for the same reason your computer is digital, because it needs to stably store memory over long periods of time. And normally, comparisons between computers and biology are not worth the paper they're written on. They're just specious, glib analogies. But in this case, it's actually true, right? The plant in this context, you can think of as a digital information storage system. Um, and we've introduced this new model where transcription comes into it, and we can ask interesting questions about how transcription talks to epigenetics. And the most important thing is I hope I've convinced you that the modelling has had a key role in this, and if we hadn't been involved in this, basically none of this understanding would be there, right? We, I, I, you know, the, I think the experimentalists might now, just now, be starting to cotton on to the fact that these states are digital, you know, six or seven years after we worked this out, theoretically. Um, so everything would have been slowed down. Might have got there in the end, but it would have taken a lot longer. I think the modelling was, was pretty fundamental. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the people who did the work. The, unfortunately, the person who did most of what I talked about has now left my group. It was an incredible PhD student, Scott Berry, who's now um, a postdoc in, uh, in Zurich. Um, and that's the rest of my group having Christmas dinner last year. And all of this has been a tremendous collaboration uh, with Caroline Dean, who I'm sure many of you know, at least the more senior people in the audience know. Um, and we've now been, been working intensively, uh, talking almost every day for 10 years, trying to understand how these memory systems work. And it's been a great experience for me, hopefully for her as well. Um, and hopefully we understood something. So thanks very much for listening.